okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, as you can tell, I don't Discord that much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now you're there. Excellent. Okay. Uh, how much time do you have? Uh, you know, I got plenty of time. Okay, okay. Because uh, maybe I wrote down a bit too many questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's fine. It's fine. I um, I have a nine-year-old um, who keeps me up late and also like I'm like, yeah, I can beat her at three and I leave on myself this time to go over the questions and all. And then what do you know? It's like 2.40. I'm like, oh, man, I'm still like getting her settled. But uh, no, no, this is uh, this is dad time now. So I got plenty of time. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we can do this in two ways pretty much. Like we can either just go through all the questions and that's it. Or, uh, you know, we can also, you know, of course have some discussion, like when something comes up, which I think is interesting, I can also just interject with another question. Maybe it depends how you want to go. Oh, well, we can go through the questions and then we, we can improv wherever you like. Cause I'm sure you're going to edit whatever you get into, you know, a digestible form. Essentially, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, how, however you want to go. I mean, the questions are good. Um, I should have left more than 20 minutes. But I, you know, I, I probably know the answers, but y you're used to doing this probably. Um, I'm getting a little more used to it. So sometimes I have problems speaking, but uh, yeah. This is a little more informal, I think, than some of the other stuff I've had to do. So Yeah, it's uh, just be yourself, essentially. Like, I'm going to be myself, you're going to be yourself, and that's... It's going to go perfect, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we can just start off. Um, first question, what is the design philosophy of Chivalry 2's audio? Uh, design philosophy is, number one, the most important thing would be to communicate the uh, gameplay at hand, like what's happening. Um, and that's sort of based on, or meant for uh, the the individual player. So things will sound different from you playing than what somebody else is hearing, even in the same scenarios because of the, uh, the chaos of, you know, 64 player um, melee game. If you're fighting in a group of 16 people, if we don't make that differentiation, then um, you'll get lost. You won't know what's happening, who's hitting who and stuff. So that's sort of the number one thing, uh, no matter what sounded cool in the game, if we couldn't make sense out of it or hear it, um, so yeah, that's what it drove everything. And then the second uh, part of design, design philosophy would be um, I try to make things sound realistic so it sounds natural in game or how you imagine the time period and the combat would be. But then, you know, take it up to that sort of Hollywood level of realism or down to that Hollywood level of realism, I guess. Um, because medieval movies are, you know, pretty big at Lord of Rings and stuff like that. You know, you want them, to, you want things to sound you know, probably bigger and more encompassing than they might. If you've ever heard people LARPing and hitting each other with shields and shorts, swords, it can sound not very dramatic at all, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So it's about refining it so it makes sense to the individual and then make it sound big and immersive and enveloping. So right to the next one. Um... How does Chivalry 2's audio differ from Medieval Warfare? Like, um, there's way more going on. Um, were there any, like, very significant changes to how you handled audio? Uh, yeah, there, there, there were. Um, we're using Wise as middleware now, um, which gives me a lot more tools to sort of refine how, um, you know, any individual sound or group of sounds um, will sound in the end towards the player. So like in Chivalry Medieval Warfare, um, everything did sound the same for each player. We didn't do that um, where we changed it. Like in Chivalry 2, when you hit somebody, it's a pretty big sound. We have like some subwoof and some low bass. Just make it really meaty. And to somebody else, they're hearing maybe half as many um, random buckets of impact sounds that built that sound up. Just so, just what we talked about from your first question, um, that you know exactly what's going on, that you're involved in a hit and stuff. We didn't have any of that. Um, so I think it was easier to get lost in the chaos of Shiv 1. But as you say, Shiv 2 is definitely a lot more going on. So um, we might have gotten away with less in Shiv Medieval Warfare 1 that we wouldn't, it would be a mess if we, you know, didn't do those extra layers of um separating the sounds 
Um, yeah, and in general, there's just a lot more sounds. Like, uh, I think the footsteps in Shiv 1 were, you know, I think they were varied for the armor types that you're wearing, leather plate and all. They would all sound different. And then the uh, the physical material they're walking on, so stone, gravel, mud, um, those were all sort of one sound effect, boiled down to one sound effect. And in this, we have... Um, we're using more sound. So the plate mail guy actually may have plate mail and a little bit of chain mixed in and they're on separate randoms. So each footstep you'll hear three different sounds. If you're a plate mail guy, you hear a plate mail, some other mixed metal and chain, and then the physical material. So the footsteps are much more like snowflakes in that sense, where instead of hearing one, you know, wave file for each step, you're actually hearing a mix of three and it just, um, a lot more blending and yeah, just making sort of everything sound less gamey and more organic. So there's also a lot of layering in in even things like footsteps and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and footsteps, impacts. Um, I, there's not much that is actually based on a single, you know, random of 16 sound effects. I try to use two different randoms for anything from doors opening and closing. It just, you put that multiplier in instead of being like, oh, that's the one of 16 door closing sounds. Now there's, with the mix of the two 16, uh, my math isn't gonna be so great but yeah maybe there's 64 different ones you could hear so you're never quite hearing the same sound twice you know uh so the first chivalry medieval warfare um that was made in the udk right like um in in this version of unreal engine 3 um so how how did your workflow change like when it comes to implementing audio when you made the switch from the UDK to Unreal Engine 4? Like, were there significant changes in how you had to implement audio? There were significant changes. And I think, uh, you know, for the engine that we were using, Unreal 3, um, there wasn't something called Blueprints yet. I think it was called Kismet. But um, you did a lot of sort of programming, like a visual style programming um, to get the sounds to play, how, when, and where you wanted them to. And then in Unreal 4, it went to something called Blueprints. Um, I do work in Blueprints sometimes. I try to save our programmers time, but um, being a one-man audio department at the time, it, you know, I couldn't spend a lot of time implementing the sound effects because there were so many sound effects to make. Um, so that's where Wise came in. So what's great about Wise is you can do things that you would normally need a programmer to do. I can prove um, sound systems out. Like um, I can say if um, somebody swings and you hear a swing sound, right? But if they swing very close to you and they still miss you, I can make that swing sound bigger. I can in wise change how close that swing is just with like sliders. So I can like test out a system before I have a programmer work on it. And so, you know, instead of asking a programmer, well, let's try this. And then he goes and does the work and we're like, oh, that doesn't sound right at all. We got to try something different. I can do all that trial and error before it even gets to them. So I'm pretty certain by the time I ask our programmers, please put the system in that I've tested on my own and made sure it worked. And, um, you know, that itself drove a lot of creativity, like just having that tool set and um, just, yeah, be able to experiment without bothering our programmers. Um, was just a really powerful asset to have in Shift 4. And that's the big thing. So um, WISE makes it also easier, like those systems, um, you know, it boils it down for the programmers too, that even if I make a complicated system, WISE has already figured out under the hood how to make that easy for our programs to implement. So hmm. um, yeah, just the experimentation phase was pretty painless. Um, sometimes development happens so fast, you could end up implementing a system, you know, without that, that you're just stuck with because now we've moved on to something else and you're like, ah, I could have done that better. Um, yeah. So why is this uh, pretty much a good uh, prototyping tool? Um, or are there also sounds in the game that's only run through WISE or is everything like hard coded? They all run through WISE before they're playing. So I don't use any of like the Unreal sound notes. I'm not using any of their um, reverb. All those systems are built into WISE. Um, I know Unreal like has been improving their audio capabilities and adding more and more and it, you know i wouldn't be surprised if at one point this middleware does become obsolete you wouldn't need it anymore and you know every time an engine comes out we look at that before we go but there were there were simple things like um in uh wise there's a built-in obstruction and inclusion so how sound changes if there's a wall between you and where the sound is made 
just stuff like that that we didn't have to bother putting in ourselves um yeah just the simplicity and easy use and it's it's um and again unreal maybe you know going this way i haven't looked at it in a while but um it's you know it's built for audio designers so um you know, back in the day, I remember working Beautiful Warfare and you're like, I don't know, I can't think of a specific example, be like, why would you do it like that? And it's probably because, you know, an audio guy wasn't really involved in the implementation of that system. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's become essential. And you, and you probably see, if you play a lot of games, you always see FMOD or WISE. Most games, even indie games, um, are using this, this audio middleware. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it a lot in the splash. I didn't know what it was though. I did not know what it was. So I, I definitely need to look into that, uh, into what uh, Wise does. Um, it's fun. I know with Wise, you can actually, um, they let you use up to like 20 wave sounds before you have to get a license. So anybody can download and play with it and learn the systems. They're pretty good with documentation online. Um, like it's pretty, um, it's, I wouldn't say simple, but it's not difficult to teach yourself how to, how to do things and how to use Wise. Um, and then you hit that, 20 wave file limit and yeah then then you've got to pay for it okay um so how does the design of chivalry 2 like the game design affect the soundscapes that are present in the game or just what happens like sonically so to speak yeah um yeah as you mentioned beginning i mean it it, it pretty much it, it's it drives everything and um a lot of it can be subtle that you might not be noticing. Um, but okay, so for example, your swing sound again, pretty basic sound. Um, you know, from an audio perspective, I try to give every weapon like its own blocking swing sounds and varity impacts to an extent too. Um, but now when we come into gameplay, we add countering, right? And riposts. <laughs> and so we need sound cues that communicate that you've pulled these off. Um, but um, also with the design philosophy, we try to keep things realistic. We, you know, we don't want like a beep or something that sounds like out of the world telling you that. So if um, you pay attention, I even lose this when I play the game because I play in a rage most of the time. Like I'm not I'm not a calculated <laughs> player where the best players probably are. But if you listen closely, um, you'll know you're pulling off a counter repost because the swing sound will change. You'll you'll hear like a, a sort of metal slicing through the air be added into that layer. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot more cases um, where that stuff is happening. Or we talked about um, how chaotic can be when there's a lot of people. Um, footsteps took a while to get down just because of that, because you want to hear your own footsteps. You need to hear the enemy footsteps. So right away, we put a system in where your footsteps have one volume setting, enemies have another, and your teammates are way lower. Um, stuff like that when we were testing when we were a smaller company we began this title there might have been just 16 of us playing and we didn't realize it's such a big deal so then we go and we go to alpha testing and right away we're like oh we have to dramatically change how we're presenting the audio like it is a mess you can't tell what's going on at all um so yeah the core gameplay you know sort of design audio for you much of the time in that sense so so it dictates practically practically like what you need to uh get down essentially like like when you get to designing like um in chivalry 2 i also noticed that like there's a running respawn and i bet that you know since everyone is in motion all the time like lowering the footsteps for a teammates like had to be done uh because otherwise you would hear them like in counter-strike like all around you like constantly <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, and it, um, I mean it's easier to know like if your teammates come behind you you don't want to be fighting guy and now have to be like oh is that an enemy or friendly even though it's a little unrealistic you don't have eyes in the back of your head you can't hear who's coming it's it's absolutely necessary or else you'll be dying um you know from your from your ear a lot more often than you probably already do mm. yeah things like that um but there's also little things like little colored things um like you mentioned along uh, run and respawns, we realized that even, you know, with 64 players, medieval movies and medieval war included thousands, right? So we wanted to present that there was more happening than, than actually was in the soundscape. Um, so you always felt like you were in that, you know, giant massive battle. So stuff like that, when you're running in, we took certain sounds like uh, death cries, I think like heavy pain sounds, cause like small, medium and large ones. Uh, battle cries we added a distant sound system 
that has those they play, you know, rooted from you um, in the close proximity as you would normally hear them. But then for people far away, we added sort of an echo and over the hills. Uh, you hear this with um, a lot of blocking sounds. So as you're approaching the battle, you might not see it. They might be behind the you know, castle walls, but you'll know where most of the fighting is happening because this second layer of sound is coming at you. Um, so that's, that's both for gameplay reasons and for artistic reasons. Um, so we, we, we distance, the distant sounds of war, warfare, like they're real, so to speak. Like that's, it's actually happening in the, in the game space. Yeah. So like our designers, I think when they came to us, they're like, can you do something where when you, when somebody gets hit, you could just have like a group of sounds go off. It sounds like a battle. And I thought, well, I think we can do better than that. I think we can take the most, the biggest sounds, the dying, the big hits and all that and have those come. And then positionally it'll make sense too. And I, I think we pulled that off. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, I didn't know that. That that. Okay, interesting. Because because a lot of games also like fake the distant battles. Like uh, in Half Life Two, you have like uh, shooting in the distance, whatever, and it's not there, but it sounds convincing. Um, yeah, and and that's that's part of my de design philosophy. Because as a a gamer who really appreciates audio, which sounds like you are, um, it sort of bothers me. Even the simplest thing, you're like, all right, this is a stereo ambience track. I'm hearing. You know, I'm hearing a bird over here and I turn this way and the bird isn't moving with me. <laughs> Little things like that bother me. So even when it comes down to like our crickets, I don't have like a, a you know, I might pad it with one stereo file that turns with you. But stuff like crickets, the, the quick short sounds, it's actually like a random generated field that attaches to each individual player that only they hear. And it just randomly picks points around their head and yeah, now you're not in a game anymore. You feel like you're in, you know, the nighttime cricket field. And um, so, yeah, that, that's a big part of my philosophy. When, when you know you're in a game, that's sort of a last resort for me. If you're making a meta sound to convey something very abstract, like I try not to do that. It's always like a last resort sort of. Um, I, I stumbled across a game that uh, Torn Banner made, which is pretty obscure uh mirage can warfare i did actually get a key of that and i did try it out and uh i i spotted like some of the same footsteps sometimes uh, and i wonder like is like is a lot of the systems that are in the chivalry 2 audio wise do they also kind of exist in mirage or um was it improved upon or like was it different because that was i think the first unreal engine 4 project you guys made right it was, and it was my first time using wise. So I would say it was, you know, somewhere, uh, obviously, uh, in between point between the two chivalries. But um, yeah, it's funny, you know, it's the same footstep sounds because a lot of love went into that game. So I did try to use, because it's, um, I can't remember the issue, but there was some issue. We couldn't run servers anymore. It didn't sell well. Um, so yeah, some of the footsteps, uh, I believe the, the physical material type footsteps I did pull in. Um, the armor types were new. Um, so those were there, but there weren't a lot of systems. Like the music system was different. Oh, I think something specifically that we pulled over how, we're, oh yeah. How we're doing, um, projectiles because that was the magic based game. Right. And, um, you're throwing giant boulders or shooting fireballs. Um, so what we learned in Mirage to help the player identify when he was being fired at, right. As opposed to just when there's a projectile in the air. Because it does sound cool when all the arrows are going, foo, 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 foo. but then you get hit and you're like, well, I didn't, I didn't think they were shooting at me. Right. So we learned very quickly in Mirage that we had to do something different. So there we put our, um, our projectiles on a cone attenuation where most sounds have a full circle of, you know, how long of a distance you can hear it. We have the arrows on a, on a cone. So if you're, if, you know, if they're aiming at you and this is enveloping your ears, now you're getting the full volume. And I believe we added an extra level, like an extra set of sound effects to make the projectile even bigger. Um, we did use that in Chivalry. And so if you're out of that range, you still hear them, but they're muffled. They go through like a low pass filter or something. So they're still there as color. But if you if you pretty clearly hear an arrow as a player, if you haven't figured it out yet, they're shooting at you. They're most likely shooting at you or somebody very close to you. Um, but the other thing we carried over from the projectile system was, uh, I think we're calling, I called it a close call system. Whereas, um, we had a programmer put in a personal bubble around you. So maybe the size of another person all the way around. And anytime a projectile or even the swings that we talked about the swing sounds when they're big is when that, uh, personal bubble is being penetrated. 
So that's when you hear those really loud arrow sounds like, and um, they're like our favorite sounds in the game. Um, but every, you can't hear that for every arrow um, because not only would it take away the uniqueness and the sort of specialness of the sound effects by hearing them all the time, you would always think you were just, you know, being fired at. But when you hear those, that means a guy just missed you. So you're either incidentally in the line of fire or like keep moving, get cover because some Archie's got a bead on you. That uh, came over from Mirage. Um, and then the rest was just, you know, this first time working with Wise. So I think at the time I was fe- sort of feeling my way through it. Um, by the time Chivalry 2, I was working on it, I, I felt like I had a firm grasp of that middleware. So, yeah. Um, it was it was a fun game. I really enjoyed playing and testing that. There were probably a lot of reasons why, you know, it didn't work out. But uh, it was a joy to work on uh, from an audio perspective. But um, another reason it was fun for audio is because, you know, I, I do love the Chivalry franchise. It's very fun, but um, it's very rooted in realism. And in Mirage, you know, we got to do all this crazy stuff with magic. So it was fun sort of getting a break from just the constant smashing of metal and <laughs> screaming and blood. I mean, that was all in there, but um, there was also that uh, fantasy layer that was fun. To- you have a layer on top that made it even more interesting also. Uh, it's also still quite fun. I mean, I mostly, like, you can't just play with bots now, and there's very rare instances where, like, one or two people join in, but the game, like, holds up. Like, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, um, it's nice to hear you say that. It's nice to hear you say that. Yeah. Yeah, and also the with the arrow sounds. Uh, I bet in, in medieval warfare was also a little bit similar, right? Because I also noticed in that game, like basically in all chivalry games, like when when you hear that arrow, like it's always terrifying. Like as a player, like it, it's oh shit, uh, I'm in danger. I have to go. Um, yeah, um, it's also like very piercing with. Uh, it's like a higher frequency, I think, right? So, yeah, yeah no, it totally is. So, yeah, so the, the idea for that system, you know, we, we grew a Mirage and then we we took it from magic to the arrows and stuff. Um, and to, yeah, there's a piercing place in EQ, probably like 2K, somewhere in there where everything sounds loud no matter how loud it is. Yeah, we hit that really hot. Um, also, when you get hit by an arrow, I believe you're being hit by the arrow when you hear the whoop, like there's a little vip, like a whoop. Um, you're being hit when you hit that, but we added that that sort of vip to to because we found that when it, you're getting hit by arrows, it was also hard to tell if somebody next to you was getting hit or if you were getting hit. Um, so that's what we did. We put that on a very close attenuation. So you're the one who's getting that that little whiz right before it comes in. Also, it you know with the personal bubble sound and stuff. Um, that took a lot of iteration, though. It was. Um, because archers, you know, ever since the first chivalry, as you probably know, is is they're they're fun. They're also a source of frustration for a lot of our players. Um, <laughs> you need them because they're part of medieval warfare, right? Um, so we're constantly looking at ways to sort of minimize their their surprise deadliness, right? No, nobody wants to die by an archer and never see it coming. It happens, but um, yeah, audio is the way that we try to limit that uh, as much as possible. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, the music in the game, I already talked to JD Spears, and uh, he uh, also explained to me like how music was made and uh, how like some of the dynamic like kind of uh, systems work in the game. So I think I I'm just gonna say what I think, like how I think it works, and then you're gonna tell me if it works like that or not. And yeah, so essentially like with the dynamic music, I think how it works is that uh, you start out with like one stem layer that is like less detailed like a base layer and then depending on the progress bar it's escalates it's like an escalation based system where it gets more intense as we go but it never overpowers the in-game sounds and then when you have the round ending tracks those are stereo files uh like for instance the duty and honor track that plays at the very end of a match that's how i think it works oh no you're right that's exactly how it works okay Um... Yeah, so it could either be the time limit or objective progress is when we add the layers. So the first one, very minimal, as you said, like little drum hits, little just tension building percussive stuff usually. Um, and then, you know, 25% progress is there. We let in a couple strings or, uh, you know, horn stuff come in. And then it might feel more like a, a, a song and it's dramatic um, as a objective is getting finished. And then if that objective could end the game, um, that's when the two minute music or the 
the end of round music comes in. I think we have two minute versions and end of round. So the two minute would be a stereo file that played until the two minutes was out and then it would go. But we also have um, more dynamic versions. So um, if it's an objective, so say you're in Lion Spire and you've blown up the three of the four trebuchets and the last one remains. So we would kick in a version of that end of round music that has three different, I think they usually had three different uh, stems. So the whole thing loops, but we vary, like it might play part A, part B, part A, part C. Another time you play it, it might go A, C, B, A. Because we, we still don't want you to know when things are coming. We want to keep it as dynamic as possible. And then when the round ends in B, we tack on the ending. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't, if he didn't mention that, that, that is the other level of sort of complexity. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It was neat because in Shiv 1, that was another thing that's different, right? From Shiv 1 to 2 is we just had the end of round music. Um, and I personally, when I game, I turn off music. <laughs> JD might not like to hear this, but, uh, I turn off music. So I like to be immersed in the world. Right. Um, and then with the two minute and Shiv, I'm like, I really like that because now you're immersed in the objective and, and it feels good and it makes sense. And you know, our design for Shiv 2, I think it's great because I think you get the best of both worlds. I think you get that immediate, all right, we're in this world, it's going down, and that little tension builds. And then by the end of it, you know, you got a JD banger and you're white knuckled playing, the music is driving you, you know, to work even harder. And I know our players say that all the time, that 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 experience does, you know, that maps will be won by the team that was losing because of the inspiration I've seen this a lot myself as well. And I mean, I suck at the game, but then, you know, when the music kicks in, then I notice myself play better, uh, others play better. Uh, archers stop being archers for that brief period of time and they actually use their swords. So it's uh, it's uh, interesting. Like, uh, it, has a, it has a huge impact. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty... I, I also told JD that, that, you know, there's like this massive effect on a player, like when, when this epic music kicks in, pra practically, right? Um, Great. And I think, I think there's a rule to sound design that, that also applies to music. Um, and I think games are figuring this out where, you know, you can't be at hundred percent all the time. You can't fill the EQ all the time with your sound effects. Like if everything is bass then nothing is bass, that sort of, uh, approach. And, um, yeah, I think we did a really good job in keeping music a constant, but not so much that you're like, all right, I want to turn it off. Um, so yeah. JD may happen to know that I always leave his music on when I'm playing jewelry. <laughs> okay. Um, so then um, going into like, you know, the, the, the soundscapes, like the environmental sounds. Um, I only noticed um, like, I only noticed when I played with boss and like turned every sound down, like every single combat voice, everything except the environmental sounds. Only then I noticed how how much detail there was in the environments. And uh, I wonder what is your first, like, like what, what, what is your thought process when uh, you're tasked to, um, to create a soundscape for a new map? Like for instance, for the Tenosian invasion, like what did you go through? Like what went, went through your head when you were sitting down, you had this finished map or unfinished map and you were tasked to make it alive basically. Well, um, yeah, that's, that's the, um, several week process when it came to Tenosia, I mean, I, number one was happy, uh, because we were back in that desert biome, which we were in Mirage. So I knew I had a, a decent base of good desert sounds to pull from right away. Um, so I, I with audio for, for the levels, I am probably working much in the manner that level designers and artists are where they'll block out a map. And they're starting to, you know, feel how the game flow works and they have a good idea how it could work when they build it. But some things might move, um, you know, a wall may come forward, move back. They may realize that, you know, they have to open up a wall. That's level design. So, um, so I go in and just lay the base ambience. I usually, I do like just a natural thing. I will start with just stereos, just get some wind. So we're not in a vacuum when we're testing it. And then, you know, the artists, when I see them start to, you know, those gray boxes start to get filled with art and I realize, okay, they're, they're at the phase where they're pretty happy with the layout. Um, and that's when I'll do like that cricket field. Um, I'll build, you know, um, how to make it more dynamic and feel more natural. 
Um, we did a lot of sort of birds of prey, I think, in in Tenosia. And a lot of it is just, you know, as often as we're testing the map for flow and the audio, you're like, all right, I'm hearing these birds too much. Turn it down. I'm not hearing these birds enough. I turn the frequency up. And there's a lot of back and forth before you feel like, you know, it sounds like a natural place and not too gamey. Um, but then, you know, um, I'll get thrown for a loop. The VFX car just comes in and now the sands are being blown up in big clouds. I'm like, oh, okay. So now we've got a random thing like the crickets that is blowing. Um, you know, on a, in a stereo field or a 360 degree field is blowing sand particles around you. Um, and then you might think, well, there really shouldn't be crickets here. I don't think crickets hang out during sandstorms. So like there can be a lot of iteration and change that sort of flows with the artists and the level designers. I think when we launched desert, right. Shortly before we locked down, it went from day to a nighttime map. So so a lot changed there. We had to take out everything, <laughs> all the daytime sounds, and build a whole new nightscape and stuff. But um, yeah, so it's you sort of gotta you just go with the flow. Um, yeah, and yeah, you're saying there's a lot. You notice a lot of because it, it's true. It's another thing in playtest when we playtest a small amount of people. I can still hear the map ambience in the six four level maps. If I lone wolf it. Or, you know, if I end up at spawn by myself or something, then I'll get a bit of it. But yeah, in the chaos of battle, it's, um, you don't always pick up on how much is going on around you. It's true. Yeah. Um, and I think, oh yeah, I wrote down this paragraph and the questions. I think I'm just gonna, wait. Um, actually, I think we, well, this is pretty much covered, but um, I, I can, add to something there uh, essentially like the next question was uh pretty much what you just answered like you know with like um you know how you go through like you know building like a level like with uh, the sounds and uh, i just noticed like how, how many details there are like um there there's one map where there's this wooden tower like in the middle of like meadows right and there i noticed like going upstream like from from um the ocean to the river like at the ocean there's the seagulls there's the uh, waves crashing into the beach there's just the ocean sounds you go up and then you hear i think there's a waterfall or something like, like you hear like very fast river sounds and the ocean sounds they slowly fade away and then depending on the velocity of the water on the river the water sounds change so uh, sometimes the river is faster so there's more splashing more water and then when you when you're at this uh, little settlement there's like only like a little trickle and uh, uh, I wonder like how do you set this up like do you have like uh, like uh, event triggers like you know little spheres that you put put down and say this is where you play this audio this is where you play this other thing and uh, yeah like how does that work like how can you achieve that much detail in you know yeah no there's probably a smarter way to do it like I think you're talking about raid on Aberfell um, yeah, yes because you land at the beach and you go up and you fight the tower um so there could be ways like if they put if the vfx artists put down the rapids like we could add a blueprint to the rapids themselves and put okay well this is the rapidly moving water so we'll have this water sound play um yeah and to sort of take the load off of programmers and because of how quickly you know maps are iterated on change i don't do that so that's actually all hand placed um there's a guy on the team, Mark LePage, who I've sort of trained up to help me in audio, and he worked on that one with me. So, yeah, we we're just literally hand placing, you know, the faster sound here, the water one here, and this and that. But what we are doing is um, shaping how the attenuation works. So, when we talk about attenuation, we're talking about the distance in which you hear, but we can also add a low pass filter to that. So, you know, as you approach a river outside in real life, you like you like. I think there's a river, and as you come, you can start to hear more details, like the, the you know, the bubbles and, and the individual ripples and stuff. So, we decide, you know, what curve does that is that a steep thing where? And usually with water, yeah, it's a steep thing. So you hear it, you hear it. Now you're right on top of it. Um, and then there's another thing called um, I think it's spread in Wise. So we might use a stereo file, and this this will work with mono files too. But um, for that water sound, so when you're up against it, it sounds like it's in both years and it's encompassing. But we can also say, you know, as you approach, what percent of that 
stereoness is coming in. So you get this really, yeah, which I think is what you're alluding to. You're like, wow, this sounds like, you know, like it's changing when I'm up here and up there. And it is, but that's all through just setting up a wise attenuation um, on individual sound notes. So we do, you know, carefully handcraft um, what you're seeing. And one cool thing in Unreal is like when we put a event down, say, you know, we made a water sound, we say attenuation should be like this. And I made this in Stones Hill, a uh, different map. Um, those sounds may still work good. When I put them in Unreal, Unreal will be like, uh, do you want the same attenuation or do you want to scale it? Maybe you want half the length of attenuation. So we can save a lot of time there So because we already know those water sounds work because there's similar stuff, I believe, in Stones Hill where there's like a lake with some waves coming in. Um, but yeah, it can be funny uh, when we talk about Stones Hill. I, in Raid, I think that river always stayed pretty much the same shape. In Stones Hill, the waterways kept moving. So I would have to go in and like pick up all those water knowns, go rehand place them and check them and make sure they sure made sense. I probably did that like, you know, six times before we launched that map. But yeah, that's that's careful craftsmanship. But there are other things you can do. Like you like you said, um, we can say when the ripples are here, we'll just put down a smaller attenuation, have that on top of the other water sounds. But we're just carefully blending. Um, so when you, the, the regular water sound is probably you're curving down at the same time the other one is, so you're getting a crossfade like effect, which makes it seem like it's morphing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I imagine it was like, uh, you know, you have like one sphere here and then another sphere there, they interlock and then that's where crossfade happens, where like one fades out and the other fades in. Uh, that, yeah. That's how I kind of visualize it in my head, like how you placed it maybe. Um, yeah. Um, Next one, I think, oh, okay, this is a very snarky one, uh, this question. I think you know which one it is. I'm just going to read it, like, one-to-one. -one. Um, how important is sound in a subliminal context for a player? Most players do not take the time to explore video game environments to appreciate the sounds of flies whizzing by your ears or to relax by the side of a lake. What would you reply if someone implied that you put too much effort into a soundscape because no one hears the difference anyway? <laughs> snarky answer is uh who cares what you think no i don't know um, <laughs> no it's it's funny um i mean that, that i mean that, that could be a legit critique if say more important things don't sound great if ship players are like wow the ambience is really great the combat sounds are terrible i mean that's a real legit <laughs> gripe right um but no it's uh i mean i think it's important and it's important you know, just going back to the design philosophy, the number two is being realistic. And if you're on your own by that, you want the waterfall when you get closer to it, the base to start hitting you. And you want the, um, you know, the sounds of the peepers of the frogs to not be um, where there's no water. And yeah, I mean, we, you could phone it in and still sell a decent ambience in our game. Um but I don't know. It's nice. I think if, when people play our games enough, they, they may get bored and try to, to go off on their own. There's there's quite a lot of uh, Easter eggs in our game. And I think when it first came out, somebody was tracking them on YouTube and stuff. Um, the level of default, one of those, <laughs> if our game didn't sound good, people at work would probably be like, why were you doing this? I think we have like two minute long plays in some case. We have a random of like 24 different things and um, like Monty Python esque style thing we have three witches that are doing a, a recipe and i think they um they're reading off the ingredients and one of them says they need malrick's left stone and they realized they were about to make this potion but like how are they gonna get malrick's left testicle like <laughs> anyway <laughs> so yeah there's more detail than even that guy probably even realized but uh anybody who loves a game and plays it enough i think those are the people who really appreciate that that level of detail and um it's also it's it's fun when, when when you know with all the screaming and smashing and, and yelling you know everything's always up here if i had a chance to just be like i'm just gonna work in ambience today and just sort of clean out my ears and now i'm sitting by a lake while i make it you know so uh therapy game development therapy for me also doesn't hurt your eardrums too much <laughs> yeah um and i i think i think it's it's uh, pretty important like to to have these uh, environmental sounds myself uh, because for instance like when you when you look at the macro scale, I mean, sure, I mean, it's it's a game with, like, massive, like, battles and everyone is screaming and running to an objective, whatever. But then on a micro scale, so to speak, like, you know, there are, like, these little interactions in Chivalry too, like, where 
I don't know, like some people are like role playing, like, you know, laughing and emoting and whatever, and they go off somewhere else on the map where it's less populated. And then, and then it's good to have this waterfall sound on that waterfall on the right side of the map where uh, no one really is like normally, you know, like, like a battle is somewhere else, but then when you're out of the battle, then those sounds become more important. Right. So I think, I think for that, it's pretty important because, you know, if you, there are some multiplayer games where there's just no ambience at all, like nothing pretty much. You know, like you just maybe hear like some wind, or then that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, yeah. File with wind, call it a day. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you're right, you're right. And I think I think it's you know it's not only you know audio that that's realized it. Like I'm not the only one in in level design and stuff. I'm pretty sure you know I'm not privy to their meeting stuff all the time. Um, I'm pretty sure they're thinking that way too. That they're they're building little parts. Of map. I know there are Easter eggs, plenty of visual Easter eggs, and there's like secrets where you find a key and do this. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, our our team is primarily made up of gamers, uh, gamers that you know really play and get into their games, um, and I, I think that carries over to our work ethic and, and presentation. But it also helps, um, you know, it takes a lot, you know, to make a chivalry map. So if we're bothering to do it, like we go big, you know, and try to mm. make it as special as possible. Yeah. Um, I also have to say, like for for uh essentially an independent production you know like i mean the torn banner is still an indie studio right so and considering that you're like a one-man band when it comes to the audio i mean there, there's just so much going on like to me it sounds like a triple a production pretty much you know like like there, there's like so much you know with like uh, voices sound effects music everything oh oops yeah everything um so yeah um um, appreciate that it's great to hear too yeah <laughs> and i mean it um okay this one's interesting so i i uh watched the um stream you did once um like uh, on the torn banner youtube channel like about the audio and uh there you also mentioned that uh not that much foley was done for the game and that you mostly use uh, library sourced audio and uh, I wonder, uh, how long does it? T how long did it take you to uh, source music, or not music, but uh, you know, sound effects? Uh, and uh, how how much time was spent gathering all of these sounds up, like for use in the game? Excuse me. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's it's. Um, yeah, I, I mean, when we started. Um, I think I probably tried to lay out all our basic systems and then, you know, anywhere I thought I was, you know, maybe it was a little weaker. I, I did source libraries or, um, or did some Foley at that point to try to fill gaps. I think at this point it should take longer, but I have, um, when I first started working on age Chivalry the mod, I think I bought my first sound library and, um, I, I liked working in indie, so I've always just bought my own sound library. So I, you know, when I made money, I, I reinvest every year. Um, so at this point, I kind of know at all times what I have, because I'll sometimes, you know, I work in passion projects too on the side and stuff. So I know my library very well. Um, so when I add to it, I'll just, I'll actually just listen to the library. I mean, sometimes it'll come with thousands of sound. I'll just make sure and I'll, you know, sort of footnote, oh, this will be good if I ever have to do a, a boulder hitting someone again, you know, like <laughs> kind of know it might come up. Um, so I wouldn't say it takes too long. If you went in blind, like, yeah, it can take a while um, to find the right sounds. And I think I mentioned in that interview, a lot of times the right sounds come from the wrong sound. Like you may be like, oh, I need to sound song get by plate mail. And I think you use the example of a car crash. Yeah, the right sounds can be somewhere in that. Um, that sound file but i you know i would say implementation and sort of polishing after it's been implemented is longer than the sourcing but there can be certain things that come up and you know we set a bar at this point so when we're adding new things to updates like i have to hit that bar so yeah sometimes something might come up um to where yeah i could be you know i could be looking around um for a half hour an hour for one specific sound um and then other times you know it could be something as simple as like i'm just gonna take two kitchen knives and go shing shing and like yeah so it's uh, when it comes to the foley versus library it's sort of 
you want to be able to just find your library. You, you can't always, but when you do Foley, there's a certain amount of setup. Do you have the materials? Do you have the room? Um, yeah, so there's always sort of a trade-off there. But, um, yeah, I think you're, uh, another question you had that probably relates to this, what were the more difficult sounds? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, crossbows. I think I mentioned that in V2. Crossbows are very hard. Um, I, I would love to talk to people from other games. And I, you know, I can't think off the top of my head, but a, a good sounding crossbow sound. If I ever hear one, I would love to talk to sound designer. Like, Where did you get that? How did you do that? Um, there's just something, an actual crossbow is a very simple kind of sound. A lot of in, um, old school, I've seen YouTubes of people firing medieval crossbows and they almost sound like gunshots, especially the impacts of those. Well, I mean, it almost sounds like a gunshot. Um, so yeah, they were very, they were very tricky. Um, I may mention that interview too, that footsteps were very difficult. We talked about that earlier. Like we spent all the way up until the game was launched, still being like, maybe we should hear him further. Maybe we shouldn't hear him that far. And um, that was a constant tug of war. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else that really stuck. It's getting more difficult as the game goes on because we have like, you know, 30 some weapons. And I said earlier how I liked each weapon to have its own blocking sounds and its own swing sounds. Um, yeah, uh, at some point I'll either need to create more or get more libraries because I'll run out. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've so many weapons in the game. I mean, even like, you know, you can pick up anything, a mop. And some of those got their own individual sounds. Some of them are like, all right, that's close enough to the quarter staff or something. We just put that on. But, um, yeah. Um, and while it's a cool feature, I imagine it also could be a little bit of a nightmare to actually, you know, ma make it sound right. Every Like, you know, when when you can pick up an anvil and uh, throw it at someone, that's some th that's different than picking up a chair and bashing someone over the head with it, right? Or, um, you know, uh, throwing, you know, dung at people. <laughs> you know, like, like everything like sounds so different. And uh, um, I wonder, like, going over weapons, um, were there, like, specific things that you had to look out for, like, when, when creating sounds for a weapon or an improvised weapon that you pick up off the floor like um uh when it comes to for instance like frequencies like lower frequencies higher frequencies or um you know what could you do with it like without it becoming too busy yeah no that's that's a good question like so the swing sounds we wanted those big and so we did that personal bubble where they're big then but not when they're just outside of that um weapons themselves i mean there were some things like i think the swing sound on the highlander sword is pretty big but needs to be right because the guy's just doing a 360 um even if you, it's not in your personal bubble you're like all right now i pay attention to him he might not even be fighting me and hit me so you got to go away so yeah there's that sort of i mean the go-to cut through your you know headphones and reach you frequency probably between like 1000 and 4000 Hertz, maybe 2000 uh, would be the, the sitting on that. And then there's your bass frequencies. Um, so when you get hit, like we, we do do sub -less. when you get hit, when you hit somebody else, because um, that's most important. And we try to, you know, let them go otherwise. I mean, some seize machines, explosions and stuff, we use them. Um, but yeah, the it is a, it is a challenge. Um, even doing the, the impacts themselves. So... We have a layer, when you're hit by a weapon, um, and usually I build this out of the blocking sound, so the ting of your sword blocking, I'll shorten that, do a quick fade, and that's part of the impact sound now. So it sounds like that same weapon, you know, pretty realistic. That's in the um, impact effect. Um, so it's blood, bone, armor type, and just a general uh, attack type gore. So chop, slash, blunt you know all that so we're looking at at least four different randoms um so what i tried to do there was look generally in the uq the, that blocking sound where's that the hottest so let's say that's that's 2k so i'll notch the files the wave files for the blood the gore the armor at 2k generally so that they sort of jigsaw and i'll do the same thing with the gore and stuff that may be bigger it's more thuddier so around 500 now i'll notch the the uh the sword impact and so on when you add layers um i think that's what you're getting at if you're too hot you know in one area of the eq you're going to lose it and that that is a constant struggle and um i think if you know in the next game i work on i think i will be more surgical 
in working on that um because i yeah i did the same thing in shiv one and just as a self critique i think i could have done better in shift two but just like as you said the sheer amount of different things going on um you're constantly wrestling that bear but yeah so it's, it's you do the same thing in music like you know you got two guitarists you got to separate their tone you know so you can hear them on the album it's just sort of that same approach too to the layers of sounds that you're hearing um but yeah sometimes <coughs> excuse me the other sounds will dictate the sound you need to use we need a new meta sound it needs to cut through well the only eq space in combat that i can use you know might be here so I might find a sound in a library that you're like, this would be perfect for it. And then you're like, mm, that's not really punching. I need something higher. Um, so yeah, kind of what you've done before is defining what you need to do next. Um, sort of approach. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> I, I noticed like throughout the interview, uh, like you mentioned a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the 360 like sphere around you, like, or like overall like this, like how sounds behave in like a three-dimensional space. And uh, I wonder how much how much work was put into Chivalry 2's audio to um, ensure this three-dimensional kind of feeling or um, like, like w what is what we hear like most of the time? Is it like mostly just stereo stuff or is it like something more fancy like HRTF or binaural audio or something like that? Uh, yeah. We didn't go far. So most of it is stereo. And like I said, that spread thing. So say someone's ringing a bell when you're right up against it, we hear it very much. It's right there, but also all around you. As you get further away, it's echoing over the hill. So it becomes more of a stereo. The sources become stronger, the in-world and the stereo. And then we have um, that 5.1 system and ambience where the crickets are going all around you. Um, aside from that, you know, most of it is just carried by what's happening in the world and its placement. Um, I think sometimes when you need to hear something that may be more meta, um, I'll use just stereo just so it it's more audible over, you know, the other mono sources. But um, yeah, nothing really more special than, than that. But I think, I, I think just the, you know, the melee nature of the game and stuff, um, yeah, that sort of immediate sphere is the most important area in how you <laughs> use it, because that's where you're going to get killed. I think it'd be interesting. I think I'd find it easier if I worked on a gun game one day. Like, I think I'd find my <laughs> workflow would be a lot quicker. But, um, and in single player game, like some of that binaural stuff, um, and, you know, in VR and stuff, like some of that stuff I think would be more fun to work with. But I think just the nature... Because we haven't talked about optimization and all these sounds are going off, going off. You know, that's a struggle too. And I think it would be great to work on a single player game again sometime. And I bet you'd be a lot easier because um, we wouldn't have to worry about, oh, there's just too much going on. Um, we could direct what's happening when and how you hear it. So, you know, in a single player game, oh, you blew up the tower. Now it's going to fall on you. I don't even have to put that in world. I can do a 5.1 audio thing and get real you know technical with that sound but it's uh in our, in our game where there's so much chaos and um and variance and dynamicism like it's not really a lot of opportunity to do that i i wanted to get into optimization as well uh like as i did for a mirror's edge project because i found it really interesting to especially to optimize for a console and uh you know uh I mean, with 64 players, uh, and on console, 64 players also exist, right? Like, uh, there you also have 64 player uh, multiplayer, right? I think, yeah, I think with our horses, we had to limit that. So I think there may be some limits. But yeah, in general, I'm pretty sure on all the platforms. I play on PC, so mm -hmm. I, I haven't thought about it in a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I wonder sure. with, like, you know, you have 60, let's say, worst case scenario, you have 64 players uh playing at the same time in the server uh and most of them are pretty much in the same area you have all of these different eqs and uh you know the environmental sounds the combat the uh screaming the voice spamming all of this all of this stuff is happening at the same time and i wonder um how much did you have to or like what exactly do you have to do to optimize the game to run on consoles like uh, with ram limitations or cpu limitations 
That's a good question. And now it's a struggle. So on PC, we could go higher quality. Um, we could get away with a lot more, obviously, and a number of possible simultaneous sounds. So I think by the time we get down to, you know, the past gen, um, you know, the, the PS4 um, and whatnot, we had to limit the amount of, of sounds you could hear. But in some cases, we're, we're also limiting the, um, the quality of the source. Um, and that can be, you know, so when, when you change, yeah, it's, it's crazy because you can save Ram, but d ding your CPU more and you, you could do things in audio that will help the CPU at the cost of Ram. Um, so this was the great thing about our partnership with tripwire is they, they did, you know, majority of that, uh, QA, I got to use their audio lead as a resource and they've been working in console for so long and I was a big deal with our partnership. So, um, where I wasn't able to work it out, they were able to come in and say, I think here's the system. We ran into the same problem, you know, here's the system we built. Um, and some of the systems where if some things like, um, occluded, uh, that sound won't play at all where it is playing, but it's being muffled normally, but they had a system built where, well, we're just not going to play that. We don't need to hear it, you know, stuff like that. And it was just sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, chipping away where you could at these things. But there's a lot of layers of protection built in the wise. So you can set, you know, the priority, how important is the sound? So a footstep ultimately, um, you know, is it more important than the impact? No. So we can judge that. Um, the arrow travel sound, is it as important? Like, yeah, it's, it's kind of more important. We need to hear if it's coming in. And so you're sort of like, so you do your priority. So when we do hit the max level of sounds, we're picking which sounds we drop first. And that um, priority system is also based on proximity if we want it to. So, all right, melee sounds are very important, but at this sort of distance, they're not as important. So it's this constant, like, they don't really need to hear this. They won't notice if we throw it away. And that system, you know, it took a while, trial and error. Actually, I, I think we did pretty good, um, probably because of Tripwire's experience in our own guesstimations, um, to where it wasn't a brutal struggle. But, you know, it was constantly like, you need to save 10 megabytes of RAM for us in the game. Or, um, you know, we 2% CPU needs to come back out of audio. And, um, yeah, constantly find ways to do that. But there's a, there's a lot of tools that we're building. The, like, if we didn't have WISE, that would have, we would have had to hire several programmers probably to just get that system in. Um, and I sound like a salesman for wise, but <laughs> if it's good, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. Like um, that guy I mentioned, Mark, uh, he helped me a lot with that. And so the two of us without bothering anybody else, we had important things to do too. And getting the game to launch, you know, we were pretty much able to handle it with the guy from tripwire and us too. Um, I don't think there was ever much concession though. Like, I don't think we were like, we would have liked to do this, but you know, because automation, I think we found a way to make all our designs work. I can't think of a system that we just dropped because it was bad, but a lot of that is already done in design phase. Like, um, there's simple things like just your basic torch. I won't sound those. I, I, I don't like if they're just decorations, sometimes like a level designer or, a, a, an artist may make a torch and they'll be like, Oh, we'll put a sound. It'll be nice. Now there's, hundred torches doing a torch sound. I'm like, no, it's not worth the, the optimization hit or something. So it's kind of something. Yeah. That you think of all the time. I must've been bad at it before because we were doing PC and I was getting in trouble with my programmers. Like when we were doing Mirage. Um, so I think, um, <laughs> I got much better at knowing before I built a system like that will just be too big of a hit. Um, on the consoles and stuff. And then from there, there's other things where, like I said, we can, you know, change the bit rate, the quality of the sounds. And, you know, there's a time where you're like, oh, sorry, PS4, we got to go to a different, um, you know, a different sound setting for you guys where the PC guys are, are going to get to hit, hear it more full quality, stuff mm. like that. And uh, I guess, I guess the Tripwire guys are the uh, perfect people to ask because, uh, I mean, some of their games are also these like massive multiplayer games, like you know, Rising Storm 2 Vietnam, uh, like where there's also like I think even over 64 players, like at the same at the same time, like you know, with a lot of shit going on. Um, so I imagine they they're massive help, especially with the Unreal Engine. Um, but yeah, um, with uh, what you mentioned with uh, favoring either CPU or RAM, um, is that the trade-off with um, 
uh, encoded versus unencoded audio, where basically if you have a a wave file, it plays without limiting the CPU, but it has to be like more data stored into RAM and vice versa when you have, let's say an Ock Vorbis file, like it's it's compressed, it's encoded. So you load less into RAM, but there's more of a CPU usage, right? Yeah, that's what I was alluding to. And um, yeah, yeah. So there'd be times where it's like, oh, you need the RAM. So we give them the RAM and then like, oh, you need the, <laughs> the CPU. So yeah, then we had to find our answers elsewhere. Like we're going to have to drop more of these sounds. So like that distant system that I told you about, um, that's getting dropped by proximity and uh, importance. And then there can be certain things like um, don't have X amount of these distant sounds happening at once. We can say 12 is enough for them to hear. But yeah, that's exactly the trade-off. And when it came to consoles, yeah, with PC, the optimization, I mean, it's still difficult and you want to get you know lower spec users in there. Um, but there's no way around it on consoles. And uh, yeah, just what you said, that, that RAM versus CPU fight, uh, can can get tricky um and so there were times yeah and i think that's actually where we made some of those final savings so where i said i think most of our designs we get to keep i think how i talked about i like to use a lot of random sets mm -hmm. i think there were certain things i won't remember offhand but um that I just sort of was defeat i was like all right we're gonna have to go in pick some less important things and mix those two sound sets together and instead of having three having two um and just sort of going back from there yeah okay um, so then when it comes to, uh, voices, like, uh, you know, all the voice acting, the performances and, uh, how they're implemented into the game, uh, there's, uh, I don't know if this is correct, but I heard that, uh, implementing, uh, like all these different voice commands that it can be quite a pain. Uh, I'm not sure if that's correct, but uh, I, I heard that, um, it can be quite difficult. So, so I wonder, um, with all these different voice actors, I don't even know how many voice actors are in the game, but there's like multiple for for each uh, faction, right? Um, yeah. So you first have to get the voices, then when implementing them, I mean, all the chat wheel options, they're, they're also different. Like, uh, you know, people have like different chat wheels, kind of, you know, where like an insult maybe is different. Like, you know, you have a backhanded compliment or uh, the your mom uh, insult. Um, so... How long does it take to implement a new voice? Like, for instance, for the Tenoja invasion. Um, how did you handle that? Excuse me. Um, well, the implementation, like, we sort of had the system worked out now where, you know, it's not the easiest, just, um, but it's not like we have to do a lot of special things. Like, we know each voice, they get six of their own personal options, and they're sort of built in the same slot. So we do a teleprogrammer, well, in the wheel, it needs to be changed. So yeah, it does add work for more than just audio to put those guys in. But um, the difficulty just goes in the, just the sheer amount of time of writing the scripts, casting the actors, scheduling the actors, getting the actors in. And then the, the sessions themselves are like three to four hours. I mean, they're grueling. I do some voices myself. Um, I kind of, you can hear I lost my voice a little bit. I was just stubbing in some commander voices for like a future update. And uh, I lost my voice in an hour. Mm. So the, the the these professionals, you can tell <laughs> that they're professional because you know they're they're athletes. They're they're working out their vocal cords all the time. I think we probably push them more than the most games. But yeah, so that's a process. Um, and then cutting um, the the files. Sometimes we do them in house, and then you know it's 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 myself or Mark now who's helped me out. He'll cut it. Um, if not, I got to wait for the outsourcer to send them. They come in. Um, we put them in, and we got to test the volume levels. And everybody, you know, uh, timber's different. And, you know, we talked about that hot part of the EQ. Some guys are right in there. So they come out louder. And some of the deeper, richer voices, we got to sort of wrestle with um, constant batch processing. Like, let's do the EQ here, this and that. Um, so, yeah, they can be tricky. I know people love them, and they're always asking for more, right? But it's... Um, we need months, they, you know, I, I would say if you had to, we could maybe do a character in a month, but mm -hmm. like we should really have two to three months just to get through everything and make sure there's no kinks. And with COVID, like we, we've had sessions even where, you know, the actor can't do it now for two weeks because, you know, they fell ill and there's just a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of chaos involved in, in, in those voices, I guess, too. 
but the implementation itself, I, you know, we do do some auto VO and uh, that was tricky. Just the initial in implementation is that is making sure, you know, the player's VO line isn't interrupted by their auto VO. I can't remember if that's working right now. Cause it must be, cause I haven't thought about it in a while, but, um, there's other things too that we think about, like we don't want to take player agency away. So we were like, all right, it feels weird to be forced to say things. So we don't always do that. Um, when you're doing the objective based stuff, if you're talking about the objective working on, I don't think you hear yourself say that. So it always sounds like it's coming from somebody else. Um, so the initial setup definitely took a while to, you know, to work out the kinks. Um, and then just getting characters, you know, once that systems go and tested and good, we're good to go. But yeah, just grabbing the character itself is, is, a long process yeah uh you mentioned in the Long, longer yeah. than that answer <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> uh you mentioned in the uh in the uh interview you made before like with torn banner like with torn banner um that uh for the first game there was way more like basically friends of yours like coming in and some of them like screaming throughout the whole session you know like uh, uh and i wonder um i mean uh, you did import the medieval warfare voice lines into the second game as well right uh yeah one thing one thing i wonder there is um uh did you touch up the uh, medieval warfare voiceover performances a little bit because uh, i noticed in game that the medieval warfare ones were significantly lower quality than the uh, chivalry 2 uh, voice lines um like did you ha did you have to uh like edit the sounds a little bit to make them work or were they just pasted in basically yeah, no, we we had to edit them. I think that the the worst offender was the Mason uh, Vanguard. I might have mentioned that last interview how we did that last second in a small apartment in Philly. Um, yeah, so we did do a lot of post processing batch work. I believe that was another thing I had Mark help me on. Um, and it just we we got as good as we could, and it was never you know capture is the most important thing. It, there's a certain there's only so much you can do past the point of capture. So. We did the best we could, and we knew that people wanted the voices. And I think even newer players who didn't play Shiv 1 may even favor them, like a lot of them, because they're a different type of vibe and sound. So we didn't want to go without them. But, um, yeah, the, that, that Vanguard took a lot of work to get even to level where he's at. And that, that's just, you know, we were an indie team. We were like an eight-man team. Nobody had a budget. I, I was pretty poor and uh, didn't have any good equipment. Um, now I do. I'd love to get those guys back in and, um, you know, do a redux uh, of, of of their their voices. But I even tried. I think I added some to the Mason Man at Arms and the Agathian Man at Arms because I did him. But then even I realized that like I, I I needed the old mics to sound just as bad, or they it just wasn't jiving. And then even my voice had changed over like ten years, and uh, yeah, it wasn't working. So. Mm. It is what it is, but I think it's great that I, I think the community has like accepted them. And even though they are aware of the low quality, I think that sort of the quality of delivery and the style and just how fun they are. I think in general, people don't care. Right. And, yeah. Um, uh, like like uh, a lot of people that, that I talked to about, about chivalry too. Um, like, I mean, I, uh, I didn't play medieval warfare that much. Uh, I, I stopped playing when, the people like did the crazy combat with the uh, rain Boeing 360 and then I, I just w was too bad for the game and I couldn't play it um le so getting into the into jewelry too uh I was immediately uh, a big fan of the squire boy I love the squire I, I love a lot of the new voices for instance you know I, I don't really have this bias you know where I say uh you know I love the you know I, I don't really have too much nostalgia for a first game right but uh, I also noticed that a lot of people, uh, you know, they they love like the characters from the first game, so they would rather listen to them, like uh, or like choose them, like as a character voice, over the others because you know, I mean, they're the historical sounds, so to speak, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's curious because I think if we, you know, if we weren't an indie team and this was a title that was being put out by a bigger publisher and stuff. I don't think, I don't think they would have let the older voices fly. Yeah. I think I think it's a bit of an audio faux pas to let that quality. And I, I think because Chivalry was such a, a special game that you know, kind of 
re- gave rebirth to the genre. I mean, I don't, I know it sounds weird to talk about, like I'm really bragging, but I know we did because I was playing Chivalry all the time. Um, like I, yeah, it's it's pretty obvious that we, we sort of brought that slasher onto the map, I think more so in say Mountain Blade, who I, I think did a great job. I play that game. I think it's a fun game, but I don't think the gameplay is as fun. I don't think like, yeah, you know, I, I think people would prefer our systems, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't think those voices would be in if, if we, if we were on a triple A studio, but um, yeah. Yeah. It makes me kind of sad. Mm. I mean, maybe that's the answer. Maybe I got to bring these guys, bring these guys back. You know, if we ever revisit Chivalry again, that, that could be a project. More cheesy voice lines. <laughs> I, I would love it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm glad you brought up Squire Boy because I, I love all our voice actors, all our characters were good. But there was something about even the writing of that guy. Like, just that was his character. It was the guy who really didn't want to be there in such a comical sense. It was, like, so easy to write for. Um, the guy, I'm going to forget his name. I know I mentioned in the other interview, but the guy who came in knew exactly what we were trying to do and just banged it. Like he just one line after the other, everyone's laughing the whole time. That was a really special character. I'm not surprised. I think he's probably a lot of people's favorite. Yeah. Um, uh, my favorite line is uh, something along the lines of um, uh, you better not fight me. There might be backup on my, on, on their way or something like there might be other people from my team coming to save me, you know? And uh, like like all these, yeah. like I, I just like the first time I heard him, I just thought, man, he's such a pussy. I love him. Like, like I need I need to have this voice, <laughs> as yeah, I, I loved it. So so uh, I immediately stuck by it. <laughs> Favorite thing for him because like it, it starts out as a real taunt. It's um, what was the one? Oh yeah, I wrote a. Uh, oh, the last dummy I fought, and right there he's like, oh, he's taunting, lost all its straw, and now like. He's not even calling the guy a dummy. He's bragging about beating up an inanimate object. <laughs> or like, uh, I've been known to have meth- melons in the practice yard. Like that whole thing. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <laughs> People are losing their heads all around you and stuff. Yeah. It's so high contrast to what's actually happening. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's actually the last question I wrote in the, uh, uh, in the first like set of questions that I uh, wrote out for uh, the game in general. And... That would be, uh, why did you guys choose to opt for a more humorful rendition of, uh, you know, medieval warfare? Like, you could have gone the gritty, like, overtly serious routes. Uh, why humor? That's a good question. Um, at the time, when we were a smaller team, that was, that was sort of on me. <clears throat> and I was torn between which one to do, because in a way, I, I'm not a fan. I mean, not in a way. I'm totally not a fan of war. Um, and I don't want it to appear fun. <laughs> so I, you know, part of me was like, I'm favoring this, this realistic approach to show like, just, you know, not that gun war or war where people are getting killed by drones is also not fun, but just think of the pure horror of being like the actual, now we're the squire boy, but for real. Yeah. And you're soiling your army. And everyone's coming. You're seeing people get torn apart. You're just, you're just staring at death in slow motion approaching you. And it's going to be painful. And just like we could totally sold that in the VO, um, and I would love to try that. Like in the future, it'd be great if we had a bigger audio team and the team grew. And we were like, what if you just flip the switch? Realistic, fun, and we could actually present everything both ways. And I hope I'm not giving anybody too many ideas because that'll be a lot of work. But mm. <laughs> that would be fun, right? Yeah. But in the end, we realized um, I was, you know, <laughs> in the melee combat itself, it, it can be it can be fun. It can also get you raging. I, I, I get mad at my own <laughs> my own development team. There, there are guys on the team who I love and chat and I hate when we're playing in the game. <laughs> and whether they know it or not, they probably realize it. You know, I'm coming to kill them because, gosh, man, I really hate them. They always get the better of me. And we realized, I brought this to Steve Piggott, and I was like, yo, make the call. We, we can only do one way or the other. And I think he, he was the one who was like, yeah, I think we're going to have people just – raging the entire time if it was realistic if we don't put in that comic relief that <clears throat> you know the fun factor won't be there to carry you through any frustrating runs that you might have because as you well know if you do and when i'm doing bad i tend to hang back more and just try to add comic relief and i'm still having fun in the game yeah. if it was realistic that would be gone we'd probably have less casual players um we'd have one hell of, a, of an experience but um I don't think 
yeah, I don't think it would do well for the game or, or for the players. Um, but it's very, yeah, it's super interesting because it would be a totally different game. Totally different game. And probably, I, I would guess it wouldn't be as successful. Yeah, and uh, I think the role playing. Uh, I want. I, I mean, you must have you must have known how important that is because uh, I noticed like playing, uh, playing in dual servers especially, right? Like when you like meet people one on one and you request to fight them, and then they say either yes or no, uh, and then you get in the fight. Like you have this communication and all without voice chat, you know. And uh, there I noticed that I tend to choose certain voice lines over others, and uh, you know, people choose certain taunting ways of talking or, you know, certain like, oh, some have more honor or some insult your mom or, uh, you know, there's like these little humorful interactions that happen organically with limited voice lines. And um, I wonder how much how much uh, thought did you put into um, the actual writing process on writing, like, on fleshing out these characters? Like, um, did you foresee that people are going to communicate in this way uh, and that people are going to be able to essentially talk without talking yeah no we, we did realize that um and i think in that's why we came up with personality options um how some have more more tactical ones or actually i think they all get like you know sort of personality traits and they vary i think that was the maybe the only thing we really did in trying to get it to all work is to give players whatever kind of attitude they wanted to use um, to give them the ability to switch voices, even on mood. Um, but like in the writing itself, I mean, sometimes you'd come up line, you'd be like, oh, that's going to play off well. Somebody does that. It does happen, but um, most of it is completely random. Now, some of the options, like we did expand that VO wheel. I think we had an extra one or two extra ones from Shiv 1 to Shiv 2. It's been a while for me for Shiv 1. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, high and by, like, we did add more, like, like you said, for dual server stuff that they may want to use. Um, and then we added the actual physical emotes, too. Um, so I think for dueling, even in a multiplayer map, people go and they'll do the flourish. And that yeah. signals to somebody like, oh, I would just want to fight you. Yeah. So we did think of that somewhat for VO, but most of it is just random when it works out um, in terms of lines playing off each other. Mm. But so the voice line choice, absolutely done to support gameplay and how people play the game. Actual lines just for either the comedy or, or um, the practicality of them. But I've heard funny, um, the Berserker. I, I don't remember if I talked about this in the last interview, and I might be repeating myself. Somebody watches both. But it's the funniest interaction, and there's been a, a million funny different ones that I've heard. But the one that stuck me with the most is the Berserker. I said, I love you to somebody as a thank you when he saved me. And then uh, the guy was demigod and he said, no. And he got the line, not interested. So it was a clear thank you. And yeah, like the guy who said no, didn't know he was going to get the perfect line for kind of being hit on on the battlefield. But there it was. And when it happens, I, I think the randomness of some of these, you know, synergy between the random lines is just, it gets magical sometimes. Yeah. And yeah, and you wish you were filming like, oh, why wasn't I filming that? Because <laughs> it would totally, you know, on Reddit, it would soar to the top. Better have shadow play running all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so it fell into place essentially. Like it's just a happenstance, pretty much. That it just works out so well, right? Uh, like, like you do, you yeah. do, you do give the options for the obvious things. Like for instance, when you like throw a shield at someone, which is my favorite mechanic in the entire game, throwing the shield. I, I do it all the time and people hate me for it, but uh, yeah, I, I throw a shield and then, you know, I hate it. I kill someone and then I laugh at them. It's it's, it's just perfect, you know? Uh, so, okay, so more of it is on purpose. So on the attitude is on purpose. Like, um, I think like the Berserker, his your welcomes are just like, this is what I do. Like, so if he saved you, that's a great line, but he's also great. For ticking people off after the shield smash like that you just say who wants more and you're like oh this guy's so cocky and then other guys who are generally saying you're welcome are also hilarious guy just killed and he's like you're welcome and you're like oh now you hate you like that guy's so <laughs> cocky like yeah and it, but you also have the taunt or the your mom and it's like yeah you can be the kind of jerk on the battlefield that you want to be that's on purpose. Like we do, you know, we kind of look at what lines we already have, what types are already on either side. And we try to get like, we have a tough guy over here. So we need a tough guy over here. And we try to sort of balance it in a way. But um, yeah. 
not not my, not so microscopically to where we're writing the line okay for, for a specific another character or to play off another line yeah okay um so that's i think pretty much it from like the written down questions and i mean i did also also throw in like curveballs as you noticed uh, um yeah. uh, one question regarding the music i guess um uh, very very basic um what's it like to hear like your i mean uh, like the the tracks that jd made that you know are labeled with ryan patrick uh buckley th th those are those are tracks that or like kind of reimagining reimaginings of uh, your like of the original soundtrack of uh, chivalry right uh how's it like for you to hear those like new kind of spins on uh, tracks that you have made before oh man it is it's incredible and especially with somebody as adept as jd um like even that um duty and honor track I think I wrote for a trailer, a slow motion trailer for announcing the release date of Chivalry One. It wasn't even met for in game. Um, you know, it came up pretty magically, but I didn't get to spend a lot of time on it. Like, I, I think I'm a good songwriter. I, I write songs all the time, just you know, for for playing with other musicians and stuff. And um, I don't think I'm as good as you know at getting really down into it and like i'm not a great guitarist but i know enough where i can write some cool stuff on interesting chords and whatnot so it was kind of similar in that sense like i've taken song and somebody else took it and you're just like wow but i mean on the level that jd did was was pretty incredible um because i didn't really i'm not classically trained i don't know i don't know really how to compose orchestras i sort of did it by ear and sort of you know felt my way through that but um so yeah it's it was such an amazing feeling. I, it's hard to describe. Um, and then when he ended up orchestrating a bunch of it and just hear it play an orchestra was just, yeah, I could have lived my whole life and never had something I wrote, have an orchestra listen to it, mm. play it you know? Um, so yeah, it was really special. Nice. Um, and actually, um, one question I forgot to ask before, I just noticed that, like looking at the questions again. Um, so essentially you have like the realistic kind of uh, environments, like, you know, the, the more rustic, like medieval environments. You have the combat, you know, with like metal and leather and like all that stuff. You have the classical music. Um, but then I noticed in gameplay that the thing that really pierced through, like were these synthetic uh, sounds of the clock, like the clock ticking and... Uh, you know when like a new objective comes in and um uh, uh there i wonder um how did that decision come about where like uh you decided to go for a very synthetic unnatural sound uh in a game where everything is supposed to sound medieval and uh outdated so to speak like old so to speak yeah, I think simply put that that sound because the idea of the war is going to be over at a certain time, you know, without an atom bomb exploding at that time is a pretty unrealistic thing. So I think we're able to get away with it. But also that, you know, what does an hourglass sound like? Can't really use that. Um, so it's a good question. I, I remember even Googling, like, did clocks exist in medieval time? I can't remember the answer. I think they might have. in a, <laughs> I think maybe. But um yeah, and it comes off okay. I think I built the ticking maybe out of not clock sounds to help with that. Um, and there aren't a lot of sounds like that, but I, I think I might have missed this like in a difficult sound question. Those meta sounds that mean something in the game, um, they are very difficult. Like whether it's a, you just leveled up. Um, yeah. And I just think the, the, the more unrealistic it is, the more that you can get away with it sort of um, vibe to it. And it's just sometimes we, you have to. And I don't think we're ever really satisfied with those. I know some of our designers, are they always want to push um, how good some of those flavor sounds can be. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting next game as our team has grown to see if we, if we can do better or more with those. Um, but, yeah. It's a really good question, and it's funny because I think I think you you mentioned, um, yeah, how subliminal it is. 
Like you don't, your brain's not even telling you you're hearing it, even though it's a total sore thumb. But you're like, okay, that's time running out. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like in gameplay, notice that uh, the juxtaposition of like hearing something so synthetic in a game where nothing sounds synthetic. Uh, to me, it was uh, like I noticed that after a while, like every time at a certain time, I was looking up at the clock, and then I noticed, wait a second, this ticking sound is not there always. Like somehow this game told me that the time is running out without telling me to look up so to speak so um that's that's driven our just our, i mean i uh, that stuff is is driven um on our team not as much by me but by our designers our, our designers are very um they got a hand in everything and they're very sure of how they want to present the game and how they don't want to distract the player just what you say and those guys are pretty brilliant at it and um i think they push the envelope where, where they can in doing that and um yeah i'm thinking of uh rasmus lofstrom um i believe he's the one who asked for that and he, he'll ask me I, i'll give him several iterations and he may never be happy <laughs> with some of the sounds i've given him but i know he's he's just pushing it and trying to get that perfect that perfect communicating without interrupting and um so if he's listening we did it res we did it with the clocks <laughs> <laughs> i like it <laughs> i'm a big fan of it <laughs> i'm gonna well it's for me it's always been a challenge like i i know I'm, I'm probably pretty good at what i'm doing at this point but um there's still things that i'm not as good at uh music that's why jd's do <laughs> um these meta sounds are, are kind of a challenge for me um and we've outsourced some when we got very busy i remember we outsourced a handful of them I, actually a pretty broad swath i think we only kept a handful of them so i think that's just something that we're um that's difficult to do um, that we're not always happy with but so yeah it's cool to hear it's great i don't often hear oh i really love this meta sound you did for this you know this random thing that's not part of the game so it's cool i can tell you got your ears on then yeah <laughs> i try to get very detailed with uh what i can pick out um and uh it's, yeah it's fun speaking. uh also with the mirror's edge project that that was for instance like also something where i i immediately noticed okay i have to pay more attention like when I was told that one footstep is like three different sounds, I got my mind blown. I didn't know that that was the case. So I needed to listen in more, you know? <laughs> so um, that, that was a very interesting thing as well. But um, yeah, I, th I think, I think you know, these sounds are like very easy to like kind of gloss over, you know, like, uh, you know, a clock tick. But I did notice there was this function in the game and it did fulfill that function for me. Like it did it perfectly. So that's why I... Put that question in as well about the synthetic sounds yeah um yeah that's great that's something only ui and audio can help with but yeah now it's a very non because it's gray i think you like you have to look for it to see the clock. yeah but subliminally you've heard it so you don't have to look up and I, I think it's chivalry again the melee nature like you don't have a you don't have half a second to lose or you'll lose your head kind of vibe yeah um yeah audio has to communicate a lot so doing the best we can hopefully we're doing good there um Okay, so that's pretty much everything from me. Um, we we went over all the questions for the game. There were quite a few things that came up uh, over time. Uh, music, there wasn't really much to talk about. JD pretty much answered everything there with how it works. Yeah, I can't wait to hear him. I can't wait to hear that. That's gonna yeah. be fun. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, do you have any questions for, for me or like what I'm doing or, um, um, yeah, you can ask me whatever. That's actually, um, I do. I remember watching how many videos have you done? Have you just done one before so far? Uh, I did quite a few. Uh, when it comes to the sound design series, uh, do you mean the sound design videos? Yeah, uh, I did do some before, but they were pretty shit. So, uh, before, before the Mirror's Edge one, they, they were basically. Uh, me, like, I don't know, I played Quake and then I made this horrible video with bad audio balancing and, like, just bullshitted, like, information with, like, oh, I think Trent Reznor did this, but, you know, I didn't talk to Trent Reznor, so I don't know. So, I, I did some before, but the Mirror's Edge one is, like, so to speak, the reboot of that format, like, where I talk to people and then out of developer information, I construct a video, basically. Uh, yeah, I should watch more of your videos, and it's funny because other people who don't work in audio can listen to stuff like you're doing while they work. I can't cause I have to hear. Yeah. Uh, but I do remember checking out a bunch of that and, and just knowing that like you were listening on another level, which 
which is fun for me and um why i was happy to do the interview because i was like oh like the topics like sometimes i had an answer and then you had another question and all and i can tell you being thoughtful towards it and not just being i think this is a good audio question <laughs> and um i i wish there was more of it because you know i when i first started playing games you couldn't do much with the audio because it was you know 8 bit and then 16 bit still couldn't do much and then before cd rom you couldn't really have high quality audio and I just thought this is great. And so I started working with it and I always thought that it would be more of a fan thing. And I think that is finally, I think it's getting some steam, how important game audio is. Um, and so, yeah, it's great that somebody like you is, is doing this. So my question would be, are you planning on doing a running audio series? Like, are you on a quest now to where like after my interview, like, ah, oh, I know this other guy did a great job on a game. I want to talk to him. And based off what you learn, will you have more questions? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I definitely want to. I definitely want to get more into. Uh, I want to do more audio-based productions because uh, I, I guess I guess I'm just going to explain like how I view audio in a game. Essentially, I think that visuals are. I mean, visuals are very important, and uh, visuals I think are more accessibility. So essentially, Chivalry Two looks great and uh, has so many nice textures and uh, character models, whatever. Uh, to you know like you have a setting you have to ground the setting and uh, it has to look good and function properly for the player right um but the visuals don't really get like don't really give you the whole context of the scene and i think context is where audio shines the most because chivalry 2 could have been like if you replace all the sounds with cartoony sound effects or you replace the voice acting with uh you know the uh you know, with other kind of voice acting, or you replace the music with another kind of music, then you change how the game is perceived on the whole. And there are some games like Super Hot, which graphically are very minimal, but the uh, design of the audio really elevates it to another place. Like, so you don't think, ah, okay, this is an unfinished game. You think, ah, this this was all made with intention because, uh, you know, the sounds kind of carry the experience. And I think I think that's what sounds tend to do for games but also for uh film for instance like in, in a lot of films uh like if the audio is shit you're not gonna watch it um yeah, yeah. so i think i think audio is important yeah. for context and it also makes a huge part of the game up um yeah i love uh yeah i enjoyed the interview and um i hope you get to do more because i mean i think it'll be cool because I may, I can, if I watched your series, I'd be interested if you did more audio things and I wouldn't hear what you get out of other audio guys, because these are conversations that you do have with other audio guys from time to time. Um, and they're, they're few and far between. So it's, it's, it's cool when someone's, when, you know, doing a deeper dive, just an audio, as opposed to like, you know, even a review to be like, ah, oh, the audio is good. And then they, they move on. Right? The audio is good. Now let's talk about all the other shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You know, the graphics we'll talk about for, for two. So, um, yeah, it'd be cool if you did it. And uh, even if you had a following of audio guys listening to other audio guys, that'd be cool. Yeah. But um, I'll definitely check out what you do. And then um, I got your email address, too. If, if you hear a cool game that you think has got great audio, shoot me a line. I'll shoot you one, too. Okay, cool. Uh, one game, one game that I'm kind of looking into right now. I'm getting an obsession over that game. Uh, actually, it's Manhunt Two by Rockstar, uh, which is super controversial, like super violent game. Uh, and that game, late, I, I want to try to find people that worked on that game because there's just so much going on. Just like it's that's that's one contender for for a sound design video, uh, Manhunt Two, because. Uh, yeah, it's just so it's just so disgusting, brutal, violent, uh, and you know you have amazing voice performances. You have very interesting sounds, like during the like I don't know if you played the game or saw what game that is, but essentially the whole premise is you sneak up on people and kill them and whatever. So it's a very grim game. Yeah, stylistically. I, think I remember Manhunt One, and, and I remember it being interesting. Like, wow, I can't believe they did this. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, tried it from that. I'll play any game for good audio. Um, I don't. I don't know that I'll finish Manhunt too, but I. I mean, I, I personally like horror. Um, I think it's it's. I would love to work on horror games. Yeah, Manhunt Two is uh, super uncomfortable as a game. Like uh, the, the the subject matter, uh, 
uh, just the executions and I mean you know like uh, there's like these details in that game that for instance you have a plastic bag and you know you kill someone with a plastic bag and then you can hear the muffled screams with like this layer of the plastic reverberating you know and uh, you just sit there thinking like oh my fucking god I'm killing someone you know like the Jesus like it you feel right bothering to do it and you sign up to do audio you gotta go to that level you gotta be like what would the bags <laughs> yeah yeah you, you have to you just have to nail it and uh, you know for instance you know this is also like a context thing right like imagine if chivalry 2 had this kind of audio like for combat no one would bother playing the game because they would be too disturbed playing the game you know they would be like oh god like this is too grim like this is too much right um while for manhunt i mean the whole point is to make the player uncomfortable it's a horror experience you you have to disturb them a little bit right um funny though because uh you know i think i told you began a little uncomfortable with the interview thing and um i was like hey what game do you recommend me play like how about this one it'll make you really uncomfortable so now you want to make me uncomfortable twice but <laughs> anyway, it just it makes me laugh i don't think you're really trying to make me <laughs> no no uh but you described it i'm like i have to hear that but i'll probably um i won't play it at night i, don't, I won't play it too long in anyone's sitting so i don't end up with the worst night <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> I do. I like it. I like, I, I mean, I like horror. I think horror is very interesting. It was System Shock 2 that got me into wanting to do game audio because of how terrified I was. Just a game where you're, you're sitting in a closet and even though you're hiding from the enemies, you still hear like the positional audio from them and you're like, they won't leave me alone. You're like, boom. You're like, <laughs> there's no escape. Um, and yeah, when you can get an emotional response, you know, whether it's humor from chivalry, obviously, or this awkward and uncomfortable, I mean, it's powerful, yeah. right? Like, um yeah that'll be a interesting interview if you get that. if i get that one i hope i do because i would love to i would love to uh understand like how, how like how they made certain decisions there but yeah like that that would be like one project that i might work on and there are some other ideas like uh um let's see did i have anything planned oh uh, yeah uh dying light i wanted to look at dying light because that one is like it's, it's a zombie game with parkour and stuff. I wanted to look into, but the uh, dude that made the audio for that, the sound designer is very, uh, very inaccessible, so to speak. I haven't found an email. I only got in contact with a, uh, a musician, Pavel Blazak. Uh, but uh, yeah, the sound designer is uh, off the grid. I can't contact him. I, I have no idea how to get to him. Um, I wonder if people find me sometimes. But I mean, you found me through Torn Band. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, when people look for me, like, how did they get this? <laughs> um, it's probably more of a problem for older guys. I don't know. Younger guys are probably all over all different kinds of social media. Uh, I think I think most people don't like. I think most people are afraid to ask people because. Uh, and I had this insecurity too, you know, where I think, well, okay, this this uh, Ryan guy. I mean, he he's like super busy, and I, I think he won't talk to me, right? Like, it's not gonna happen. So I guess I'm not going to shoot him an email, right? So this is like what a lot of people like have this mindset where, you know, for, for some reason, someone that's, uh, you know, that made a game or whatever, worked on something you liked, uh, that they're too busy for you to even ask them to talk to you, right? I think that's how a lot of people think about it. Um, so how long it took me to find some time? I mean, the summer with family and all like that. But I did want to talk to you, um, especially after getting your questions, because it's like, okay, this, this is going to be a cool interview. But... Um... Yeah, I guess shotgun theory, right? You got to keep trying until you get somebody. But um, yeah, I mean, game development's busy. And depending on what company you work for, um, you know, is it an eight hour day? Really? Yeah. Do you have to commute? There? I work remote, so I don't have to commute, so I can find extra time. But if you're driving to a studio in California and you're dealing with that kind of traffic, a work day is like 12 hours or something. Yeah. So, yeah, those kind of guys. And be like, yeah, I want to come home and do an interview. <laughs> well, good luck. Yeah, keep trying, man. Um, I think it's cool. I, you know, I don't know. I, my wife and I always talk about it. Um, she's like, ah, I, it would be great if we did a thing, a blo uh, not a blog, but a, a podcast. Uh, you could do it about video games. We could do it about music. We could do this, but this and it's true. We could, um, and don't find the time to do that sort of thing. And I just think it's, it's neat that anybody can sort of have a talk show for him. It's, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, especially in getting info, like, you know, I'm not going to, no one's, Conan's not going to ask somebody to come and describe what it was like doing audio for Grand Theft Auto 8. Like, this is not happening. Mm. And it's not Conan anymore. I'm dating myself. <laughs> but... <laughs> well, whatever talkie guy people like to talk to nowadays. They're not even on TV. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but uh, as long as you're doing audio, let me know when you're doing more project. Let me know how this comes out. I'll drop you lines if I hear any cool thing. What do you think of this game or whatever? It's just cool. I don't talk to a lot of people outside the office. Um, but uh, it's cool what you're doing. And so I'll follow it. And... Also, vice versa, if you, if you find like a game or something that, that you find interesting, like uh, audio wise, then you can also shoot me an email. Like I would also appreciate that. I'm always looking for new projects. I wrote so many people in the last few weeks. Just, you know, oh, this game is pretty cool. Uh, do you, hey, you want to <laughs> you want an interview? And then. I send like 10 emails like that and I got two responses. So that's pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I'm like, that's pretty good. I would say a 20% return rate is pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, then I guess it's time for me to get to writing and, uh, editing the interviews and, uh, yeah, I will, I will just send anything that is like worth showing. I'm just going to send it to you immediately and just, yeah. It was, it was nice to meet you. So do you prefer MC or Cheekin? Or um, Cheekin is fine. Like most people call me Cheekin. Uh, MC is fine too because my name is stupidly long. <laughs> yeah. You, you, um, okay, Cheekin, you can call me Buckley if you like. I'm just so used to it. But sometimes when I hear Ryan, I'm like, all right. This <laughs> okay, Buckley. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, nice, to meet, nice to meet you too. Bye-bye. Good luck with the edit, man. I can't wait to see you. And if you get done JDs, let me see it too. I won't show Okay, you. good. Yeah. Bye-bye.